Welcome to Recalculating Small Business. Like its award-winning book, Recalculating is dedicated to small business in America. Your hosts are Don Mazella and Dan Perkins. Don Mazella is the editor-in-chief of the Small Business Digest. Dan Perkins is a registered investment advisor with 43 years experience in managing money. Dan Perkins here, your co-host along with Don Mazella of Recalculating for Small Business. Our radio program is dedicated to you, helping the small business owners increase their profits. We draw our name from Recalculating, voted the best small business book of 2017 by the Independent Press. In this book, it features ways to grow your small business. Now, here's Don Mazzella. My co-host, Dan Perkins, is on assignment. This is Don Mazzella, and our next guest is Arthur Kamatsi. He is certainly a far traveler, going from uh, Reno, Nevada, where he was born. He's now in Bali, and he joins us from there. Arthur, welcome to the program. Well, thank you, Don. It's great to be here. Well, Arthur, tell us a little bit about your fascinating background for our audience. Wow. Well, let's see. You know, I, um, I, I, I originally left the States to follow a girl um, to Korea, and uh, that didn't quite work out. And uh, I ended up in uh, Singapore. And, um, and, and in Singapore, I happened to go broke and actually ended up uh, being about a half a million dollars in debt, which I do not recommend. Do not try this at home. Um, and um, so I, I got this job in this uh, rather dysfunctional company. And uh, you know how when you first get a job, you know how you're really excited and like you're, you're thinking, wow, you know, this is going to be so awesome and like life is going to be great and I'll be able to do that and I'm going to be able to do that. You, have you ever had that, Don? Keep going. And so anyway, I was, I was really excited and, and, you know, I'm thinking like, wow, okay. So, but about, you know, a couple, like two, three weeks later, I'm starting to see people like blaming each other and um, I'm starting to see, you know, the, the uh, people that are not really cooperating very much. I'd go to people, other departments. I think, no problem. I, sh- I can make this happen. I'd come up with all these great ideas and I go, Hey, you know, you can, you've got some resources and I've got some resources and we can pull them together and look at all the great things we can do. And they'd say, look, you do your thing. We'll do our thing. And I was like, man, you know, what is wrong with all these people? And about like four and a half months later, you know, I knew I could really make a difference. And four and a half months later, I started blaming people and I, you know, people would come up to me and say, Hey, Arthur, you think you can help me out with, uh, you know, some stuff? I said, look, you do your thing. I do my thing. And, and I became part of the whole problem that I was looking at and thinking, Oh my gosh, you know, these people are bad. And I became one of those people. And, um, that lasted for a while and it affected, I, I, I wasn't enjoying my job. I wasn't enjoying anything. And, um, what ended up eventually happening was I went and I talked to some of these bad people that were making my life difficult, and I found out something very unexpected. I found out that they were real human beings, and they actually had real standards, and they really wanted to have the cooperation and everything, but the, they also got sucked in. And, and so that kind of st- started me thinking, okay, well, there's it's not the people around me, it's the environment, it's the culture. And so that started me on a, on a journey um, to develop this whole uh, culture development and understanding framework, which eventually became known as directive communication psychology. And um, so eventually I, uh, I managed to kind of quit my job in, 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 a, in a medium okay way. <laughs> And um, I uh, ended up uh, creating this um, uh, uh, brand name for myself, but I was still in massive debt. And I ended up thinking, all right, well, now I can franchise because, you know, this is working. I've got, you know, some some background. I've got uh, some case studies that are really great. So now to franchise it, I'll be a, I, I needed to have more money, which I, was, I couldn't because I was in debt. And so what ended up happening was I um, thought, okay, it's, let's move to some place that's really cool and that people would want to go to and that has low cost of labor so I can actually do all the stuff I need to franchise. So Bali was the logical choice. So there I ended up moving here. And now I have um, a big resort where I end up bringing people over and uh, I, in, instead of traveling around the world because like my, my kids now are – are 10 and seven and uh and I, I married a balinese girl and 
Um, so yeah, life is good. So, so you, you now, um, teach people how, how to, uh, better inform and better, uh, uh, communicate within organizations. Is that, is that, um, a good summation of what you just said? Well, yeah, I guess so. I guess it's, um, see, I, I mean, it's this, if you actually think about it, okay, the behavior you have with your friends is different than the behavior you have with people at work and the people and the behavior you have with uh, different, like uh, maybe your family. So you, you have different behaviors in different environments. Now you're, you're not purposely doing that. It's just that different environments bringing out different parts of who you are. Sometimes it's good. Sometimes it's not so good. But if you understand how this works and where it comes from and what things are causing the good behaviors and, and the positive behaviors that you want to have, you can actually take control of it, refine it, and create these ideal environments where you're always the best that you can be in creating the best in other people. And that's essentially what uh, we do. And we do this on a uh, on sometimes in team level and sometimes in organization level where we change complete company cultures. Um, well, uh, before we go f- further, it sounds in- interesting. You, you in effect, say to people, come to Bali, sit with us for, for some period of time, and we'll ha- we'll help you uh, uh, evolve your organization. Would that be correct? Well, okay, most of the actual organizational culture stuff is done in the organization. But what we do in Bali is, uh, I mean, we do have senior management programs here, and we do also certify coaches and trainers in uh, directive communication psychology. So they go out and do that uh, in companies themselves. So right now we have uh, over 400 licensed directive communication psychology trainers in 18 different countries. Hmm. Uh, and again, directors of uh, communications psychology. Did I hear that correctly? That is correct. Okay, and, and I understand you now have a book out on that subject, and we're going to talk about that in a minute. But can you g- give us in a few short um, minutes what director communication techno- um, psychology is is about? Well, okay, directed communication psychology is essentially the science of group dynamics, how people act and react to each other in groups and how to influence those groups. Uh, that's a nice, okay. succinct elevator pitch that uh, uh, is really interesting. <laughs> so you, no, it, uh, uh, intuitively, I, I agree with you and understand what you're saying. But uh, again, um, for our radio audience, um, you're in effect saying that you you have to change the dynamics of the intercommunication in order to improve the overall effectiveness of of the organization. Am I hearing that correctly? Uh, Well, okay, to a certain degree, yes. Okay, I mean, here's the thing. You're always communicating. I I mean, always, okay, your body language, the things you say, the tonality, uh, the way that you look at people, um, and and people are always interpreting your communication, whether it's right or wrong, okay? I mean, you know, how many times have you explained something to somebody very clearly and you say, okay, okay, do you understand? And they say, yes, I do, and then they go and do something completely different. (laughs) Believe me, more times than I'd like to admit. Hey, well, there you go. And see that what that what happens is that you have you, that, that this is that we are communicating. The question is, you know, are we being effective and are we creating environments? Because see, sometimes we talk about stuff, and what ends up happening is that we are um, accidentally taking away the gratification of somebody, which means sometimes people start to think, oh, this person is bad or this person is like this. And then people start making judgments about you. And when they start making judgments about you, what ends up happening is that um, you start getting unengaged, right? So you start to be uh, less engaged in what is going on. And what ends up happening is that uh, you become less, you, you trust less, you respect less, and well, basically you become an underperformer. So very true, and and you know uh, I'm I'm looking back in the light of what you're saying, and in particular two organizations I belong to, 
where um, the the operative word um, when you asked something was no. That was always the first word out of their <laughs> mouth. Uh, you know, um, I'm, I'm, I don't care whether it is, uh, can I get, get uh, will you get me a glass of water? No. Um, and, and uh, <laughs> Uh, but uh, you know, and, and I'm uh, I, I'm thinking about it and applying it to what you what you say, and it's, it's um, and it's so true. Well, how do you uh, uh, how do you go about convincing uh, people within an organization to change that, for lack of a better, no to a, a yes. Well, okay. First of all, okay, um, the process that we use, our, our culture process, is 100% success rate, okay? Um, the problem, though, is that there is a criteria to achieving that 100% success rate, so not everyone can do it. The first part of the criteria is that senior management must be involved, okay? That means that senior management actually sees that they need to do something, there must be, there is a problem, and they must actually go ahead and create um, a, a and, and they're the ones that they're going to not just say, hey, fix these people, but they're going to be involved in the process. That's key. Okay. So the second one is going to be where the, um, uh, the, the, the organization needs to understand that there are going to be some influencers in the organization that are not positive. And they're going to have to get rid of them in some way or another. I mean, we, we did this for the Malaysian government, and they weren't allowed to fire people. So um, they created a special happy department for them and just kind of separated them from everybody else. And that really had a, a major effect on the performance of everybody else in the organization. I wish uh, I'm, I'm thinking back over some of the people I've worked with, and I wish that that would have been a terrific solution. But what if these people are key, are key people, and in, in the favorites of senior management? Well, okay. Um, first of all, the, the the process itself is a bottom-up process. Okay, so we identify key influencers, positive and negative, and these key influencers essentially are the ones that are. Uh, they're not the whole culture ambassador thing. That doesn't work, okay? Um, this is, you, you, in order to actually make this happen, right now we're living in the, uh, in the PFB era, the post-Facebook era, right? So everything is instant, okay? You need to, people don't see something within a very short period of time, they kind of give up, okay? So um, if it's somebody that, you know, senior management, that, that's why when we, when we do this, we identify these people beforehand. We identify the positive key influencers, negative key influencers. We say, okay, we, we, we present these, this situation to senior management, and we say, it's gonna, this is the guidelines that we suggest based on the information that people gave us, because we, we already know what's going to happen in advance. So what happens is we kind of present that with our recommendations to senior management, and they say, okay, within certain guidelines, okay? And that includes potentially firing certain people that may have been identified, okay, or at least moving them somewhere. Um, so they agree in advance. And if they don't agree in advance, we can't do it because, well, it won't work if, if, if they don't agree. And, 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 so, so we we did this Malaysian Airlines. We went up with these guys and we talked to these guys uh, to to the to, to the to the senior management. And they said, "Well, you know, we don't have time to really participate in this." And I said, "Well, but it won't work if you aren't." So, I was, well, sorry. <laughs> that was that was it because they didn't want to lose their face in being down with the regular folks. Hmm. We were talking to Arthur Matsy. Uh, the, uh, Arthur, the name of your organization, and uh, let's bring in your book uh, right now. Oh, sure. Okay. The name of the company is uh, Directive Communication International. Um, the uh, the book is a um, it's called The Architects of Extraordinary Team Culture, and uh, then the subtitle Five Secrets Hidden in the Ancient Pyramids. So it's a uh, kind of uh, basically. It's a, it's a scientifically researched book that's put together in a kind of fun, cheeky story uh, in ancient Egypt. 
and it kind of gives uh, examples of uh, how people actually built the pyramids and, and um, some of the things that kept people literally motivated uh, for 23 years while building this you know, colossal building that is still standing today, while the previous pyramids before that uh, you know, barely lasted 100 years. But fascinating. We're going to get to that when we're talking to Arthur Karmazzi. 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 As an Italian-American, I should know that. But um, Arthur, I'm fascinated by by what you're saying because as I look back uh, on a long career inside and outside of uh, large corporations, but our, our audience is made up of uh, uh, small businesses. Um, 59% in in the latest survey indicate they are presidents and or owners. Saying that, Arthur, how how do your uh, rules uh, or ideas apply to a smaller organization? Are they as viable? Of course, of course. The, um, the, the, I, I mean, it's the, the smaller organization is going to be, it's going to be a lot easier in a smaller organization. Um, I mean, even, okay, for example, uh, there's a, there's this huge organization called Technique, but one of the spinoffs they had was um, a, a small uh, 75, 79 person uh, spinoff where they were basically designing offshore oil rigs. And um, I mean, because it was a, it was a, a, a still a small organization. It was still one where you know I mean people could kind of connect with each other, but it was also big. I mean you know 79 people, still quite a quite a few people when you you know kind of put them all together um, and working together. And they were already starting to have issues. And of course you know when you have a, a smaller company, it's 10 people, 20 people. I mean um, developing your culture is one of the key things that is going to make. Uh, a, a huge difference in the effectiveness of your people. I mean, we, we did a study in uh, 2011 um, based on the mean of 100 people doing the work of 100 people. Okay, so we did all these different companies. We uh, in, worked with, we uh, interviewed companies on, um, and well, interviewed and studied companies that had really great cultures and ones that, well, didn't have that had, well, poor cultures, okay, or dysfunctional cultures. And it uh, turns out that uh, you, taking the mean of 100 people doing the work of 100 people, in a poor culture, 100 people did the work of 68 people. And in a, in a great culture, 100 people did the work of 151 people. So, I mean, if you just think about payroll alone, you're getting 151% more for your money, if you have a good culture compared to, um, you know, the uh, a poor culture where you're actually losing 32 percent, and and it's interesting that it's clo- that uh, the mean, the average, was actually closer to the poor culture than it was to the good culture. And, and then, uh, 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 now that's fascinating, and I think you're so right. But uh, but let me ask you a question: do, uh, do smaller cultures do, do better or do worse than bigger cultures? in terms of the uh, uh, output per, per person. Okay, well, if you actually, if you actually think about, um, you know, some of the, the, the companies that have gone big, I mean, if you, if, uh, if you look at, um, okay, if you just look at uh, Zappos, for example, I mean, that's an ideal culture kind of situation. Okay, they started a company with culture in mind. They wanted to build that culture from the very beginning. So as a small company, before they got big, that culture helped them to get big. I mean, it literally helped them to really achieve the level of excellence and, and, and mass that they, have, that they have achieved. I mean, who, who would think selling shoes online was actually going to be a big business? And, and they have done it in such an amazing way because they focused on culture first. Now, most of the people that call me, you know, these larger organizations, they basically are, are already in trouble. So <laughs> that's, uh, that's why I have a job. And, and one of the things that we've, we've also been working with is um, uh, you know, we noticed that a lot of organi- most organizations that we work with, one of the key things is they, uh, that, that they're looking for is leaders when they, when they hire people. But 
people coming out of the university don't have the leadership skills. And uh, one of my my legacy projects right now is uh, we're building a very, very unique high school. Uh, it's an international boarding school um, in Malaysia that is, uh, uh, you know, the gateway to Asia and the Middle East. And, and there's no teachers in this. Um, and the goal, the goal of this is to really develop the students because most of the people that are um, uh, that, that do really big things are not the ones that are getting all the good grades. Okay, they're the ones that are getting maybe mediocre grades and people don't understand them. And so we're developing these people to literally be the future leaders. Oh, that, that is a, a certainly a, an important factor. Uh, 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 study after study shows that uh, here in the United States, uh, uh, many people feel that uh, the younger people are, are ill-equipped to, to be to be leaders. That they they seem to be ones that regurgitate back what's given to them, but are not very creative. Uh, uh, how in well, your oh, you first? Go ahead. No, I was just saying. I mean, that is not just in the United States. That is a global phenomenon everywhere. That's happening everywhere. Yet, yet the uh, great thing about mankind is that it has been a, an amazingly creative wor- world uh, with an accelerated creative bent. Um, uh, and, and you hope to, uh, in your way to uh, excel, uh, bring uh, younger leaders in, into the fold. Well, that's that. See, that's the thing. Okay, I mean, right now the school system is basically designed to build to create drones. Okay, people who will follow orders. I mean, okay, there's a teacher. The, you, the teacher tells you what to do, and sometimes the teachers are really great and they want to do bigger, better things, but the system won't allow them to do it. And so, what ends up happening is, um, you know, that these students that have huge potential are actually not getting the benefit because they, they, they're not getting great, so they think, oh, I'm not good enough. And then what ends up happening is they feel like, oh, because I'm not good enough, they end up not achieving their potential. And, you know, I mean, when I went to school, and I, I went to school in, in Nevada, and, um, you know, I, I was considered a special kid, okay? I went into the remedial kids class, okay, because my brain was apparently not as good as everybody else's, okay? And, well, you know, it wasn't until eighth grade where one teacher helped me to find a way to show me that I wasn't an idiot. And that changed my entire perspective. But it wasn't, you know, and it was an algebra teacher. He didn't teach me algebra. He taught me, he coached me to understand that I could actually achieve things. And even though I never got good grades on, uh, uh, great grades on the test, um, my attitude towards school, towards learning, towards life in general was completely transformed because of this teacher. And that's where, you know, we don't have teachers. We don't, we, in fact, the students teach each other. But we do have coaches in this school to support the kids to be the best that they can be within, you know, with, within their particular areas. And we've got all these different systems. For example, it, you know, the whole purpose of homework is to reinforce uh, knowledge so that you can actually remember it. Well, okay, the, the, the problem is that if you're just doing math, you, there's no point, right? You just end up having this, this thing where you're thinking, oh, I got to do math and I got to study math and I got to do my math homework and everything else. But if you actually had math that related to a problem that you were actually interested in solving that was also connected to something practical where you would get some benefit like part of a project, well, now, guess what? Now you're interested, so you want to find out. And, and also what we do is we take these the consolidated um, elements of learning, uh, English, math, science, history, etc. And uh, the kids are creating not only these projects, but they're also ma- putting this into story, which also reinforces knowledge. And they're creating books that by the end of the year, each student will be a published author. Okay, and they will have edited their book, reinforcing the knowledge, and they will be selling their book and also be competing. The entire school is gamified. 
<laughs> Fascinating. We, well, you'll have to come back and talk more about that. We have about two minutes left, Arthur. Tell us the name of your book and and uh, what what you hope to accomplish uh, by writing this book. Well, okay, a couple of things. First of all, if anybody's interested in the school, I would like you to go to kingsleyleadership.academy. kingsleyleadership.academy. It's a, it's a boarding junior high school and high school. And the name of the book is The Architects of Extraordinary Team Culture. Okay, and or five secrets hidden in the ancient pyramid. And what do I intend to accomplish? I want to change the world. I mean, <laughs> leave a legacy, change the world, create brand new leaders that are going to make a huge impact in the world. Uh, Arthur Karmatsi, Carma- uh, you've got to spell out your your uh, high school uh, uh, website for our audience because this is radio. So spell it out. No problem. Kingsley, K-I-N-G-S-L-E-Y, Leadership uh, dot academy. So it's Kingsley Leadership dot academy. Wow. Now, um, our, lo- our last um, question to you, given uh, all your experiences, what are the two things you would um, say to a small business audience you've learned to, to improve um, you, your chances of success? Wow. Okay. I mean, I, I guess probably the main thing was um, understanding the communication processes of people. And um, uh, that basically was it, scientifically, it's called the brain's ambiguity relief process. Um, if you understand how people communicate, their natural genetic ways of communicating, there's so much less misunderstanding and there's so much less wasted time and there's so much more productivity and synergy. So um, if you just do that one thing, you'll save lots of time and get more productivity. That's great. Great thoughts. We've been talking with Arthur Carmazzi. uh, A link to his website will be on recalculating.biz tonight where you can hear this and every other past and future program. We're also happy to announce that we're on iTunes, and you can take a a brief survey to tell us what what guests you'd like, just like Arthur, on our program. Arthur, thank you so much for being with us. It's been a real pleasure. My pleasure, Don. Have a great day. Want to know more about health savings accounts for your company or yourself? Go to 2hsa.com and get a free employer's primer. Health savings accounts are a cost-effective way of offering health care benefits to your employees and yourself. HSAs build retirement funds for your employees, improve morale, and reduce your health care benefit costs. For a free employer guide to HSAs, go to 2 hsa.com that's to hsa.com dan perkins here from recalculating.biz with your featured book i want to tell you about a recent interview i had with bob bethel a turnaround specialist with lots of success in small business bob's new book is strengthen your business dan's tip of the day should resonate with every small business Having a bright, clear, physical plan always adds profits. One recent survey revealed 71% of walkers responded that they would enter a newly refurbished establishment even if they didn't have anything to buy or were in the market for buy. So how important is it a small business for physical establishments where customers come in to buy? It's very important. Sprucing up a small business makes sense. Saving cents may cost a small business dollars if the right quality paint is not used. According to hotel association figures, the average time between major spruce-ups for hotels, for member hotels, dropped from 8 to 7 years in the past 12 months. Why? Because new establishments are very important. But don't think these statistics apply only to brick-and-mortar stores. The entry page for any business is that company's storefront. For those online leaders who think they are immune to the need for change to their storefronts, think again. While changing index pages initially loses visitors, 
New visitors are usually generated within three months. So today's message, in a physical plant or online, stay new, it will help profits. Marcus Limonis, J.D. Powers, and John Scully, and a hundred other presidents and experts contributed to recalculating the book. Why did all these people agree to contribute to the book? I'm Don Mazzella, and I'm the editorial director of Small Business Digest. And for 20 years, we have been offering small business leaders information and data to increase profits. Recalculating the book was named the best small business book by the Independent Press Association. Whether you need help with marketing, staffing, finance, operations, technology, or many other subjects. They're all here in recalculating the book. They're now available at Amazon at a reduced cost. We've also created the radio program Recalculating on Recalculating.biz. Welcome back to Recalculating, a program designed to help you be successful. Dan Perkins is on assignment today, so it's just Don Mazzella here with you. And our, our guest is Chris Rogers. He is founder and CEO of Colorado SEO Pros. He's here to share insights on how new ideas behind search engine optimization are changing uh, the game for small businesses. Chris, welcome to the program. Thanks so much for having me. Glad well, to be here. you know, my first question always to guests are, Tell us a little bit of how you came to, to be uh, running such a, a company as Colorado SEO Pros. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I've been in the uh, digital uh, marketing sector for about 13 years now. Um, I had a background in, in uh, marketing and uh, worked for a, a national print and digital media advertiser. Um, they started getting really into search engine optimization and paid search. Um, I kind of dove in and uh, pretty quickly in order to, you know, keep expanding on my skill sets and my knowledge in, in the digital marketing space, um, I had to leave. I did a master's program and uh, ultimately started my own SEO firm after working for a uh, leading firm out in Chicago for a number of years. Well, before we go further, uh, your website? Website is Colorado SEO Pros, like professionals.com. Oh, okay. Well, I'm going to ask, uh, before we go any further, I'm going to ask a question. You know, everybody seems to know what SEO is, is but, you know, if, uh, a lot of people still don't know uh, about SEO and why it's critically important to a uh in particular, a small business. Could you expand a little bit on that? Yeah, absolutely. So I'll, I'll give just a brief definition of SEO uh, to start out so we're all on the same page. So SEO, the acronym stands for Search Engine Optimization. Uh, and really, I would describe it as the process of helping a uh, website uh, improve visibility, traffic, and ultimately sales or conversions uh, being generated from the search engines, specifically looking at non-paid search results. Um, so when you look at a search results screen, you're going to see the, the ads through Google's AdWords platform is kind of a pay-to-play platform. And then all the main results in a search engine result page that you look at are uh, the result of Google's algorithm. Uh, SEO is really the process of optimizing a website and creating strategies to promote that website within the search engines. Uh, ultimately, so that it's um, uh, so that it gets um, picked up by Google's algorithm in favorable ways. Well, that algorithm um, so ch changes periodically, doesn't it? And that's one of the problems. Yeah, it changes frequently. So um, it is a moving target. Um, there are over 200 variables within Google's algorithm or mathematical formula, and certainly they don't divulge that to uh, companies like mine. Um, so we operate w under a lot of unknowns, but there are some, some important things that we know that Google is trying to accomplish in terms of the sites that, that it's ranking in search results. So, and Google's been very clear about those things. So um, Google and other search engines really just want the very best resources to appear in search 
uh, based on the user's search query, right? So if I'm looking for a, um, you know, a shoe store online, Google wants to show me the websites that are going to provide the very best solution to my problem. Um, so if as business owners we're really looking at how do I provide the best information and the best solutions to people's problems and then publish that on my website, um, that's where you can, uh, I think, pick up some of the benefit and be in line with uh, kind of Google's objectives. Well, uh, you, you know, uh, uh, our, our audience uh, feeds back to us, and they all, a lot of our uh, small business owners say, you know, uh, I, I get constant um, requests from people that want to do my S no. But um, a company like yours, what do you ask? Um, a, a potential new client when they come knocking at your door, uh, what are some of the questions you ask that helps them focus on what they need? Yeah, so I would say first of all, you have to be wary about people that are contacting you regarding SEO services. Um, unfortunately, uh, it is an industry where we've got a lot of really good providers, consultants, agencies out there. And then past that, we've got a lot of kind of, um, unfortunately, um, providers that shouldn't be in the space. So these can be, you know, general marketing companies that want to have SEO as part of their offering. It could be web developers that want to have that little checkbox and uh, their clients ask for SEO. So they say, hey, yeah, I can do that too. Um, or larger um, you know, national companies that are offering quote-unquote SEO services for price points that are far below what it actually costs to do it properly. Um, so those, I just want to make that warning first. If you're getting hit up via email, you do need to be very suspicious. You need to ask questions around um, what people are doing. If you look at uh, SEO hourly rates, um, if you're hiring a consultant, uh, maybe you could get someone that's uh, fairly inexperienced for $50 an hour, right? You could also hire one of the leading uh, agencies in the country, and it might be $500 an hour. What you're not going to find is someone that provides real value to you at a $200 or $500 a month price point. Um, anything sub $1,000 a month, unfortunately, if you're talking to an agency, is probably going to not be worth the value. Uh, so that's the first thing um, that I would mention there. And then in terms of the questions that we're asking, we ask a lot of questions that other uh, providers won't ask. And simply because we're a, a, a boutique agency, I uh, qualify all new projects myself. Okay? So we don't have a sales team. Uh, in our business, turnover is the arch enemy. So I, I qualify all projects myself, and we get the SEO team involved before we actually send out a contract. We've got to be within the vast, vast minority of companies that do this. Most agencies or SEO companies or SEO providers that are contacting you, you're actually getting contacted by a salesperson. That salesperson, a vast majority of the time, does not have a, a deep level of expertise as is required to properly uh, quote out your project, meaning that salesperson's job is to get you to sign on the dotted line and get as much money as they can. Their job is to not, not to figure out how much it should cost to do the project and be successful, and have it be a sustainable long-term um, relationship. Um, so all that to be said, one of the first things that you should do is figure out, are you talking to a, a real consultant, someone who is a practitioner of SEO and can intelligently answer your questions, or are you talking to a salesperson whose job it is to convince you they know what they're talking about and then get you to sign on the dotted line? 99% of the time you're talking with a salesperson. Um, the question well, uh, I'll be ask, frank with you. Uh, yeah. uh, my experience... Uh, in the SEO period, uh, space over 20 years has not been good, and we've we, we've relied on just natural growth. Um, uh, we're we're kind of a different company, but uh, I, uh, when I talk to people uh, in in the industry and people like you, uh, there there seems to be a lot of uh, uh, I don't want to call them the shysters, but less qualified people. But, uh, but the world is changing, and one of the reasons you're here is uh, is also local-based, and a lot of things are changing. So I'm going to uh, turn, 
uh, uh, ask you a general question. You know, you're here, but what do you want to talk about and, uh, that you've seen and want to talk to our audience about? Well, since we're talking mostly um, with a lot of small business owners, which which we are we are small business ourselves, I, I think some of the things that I mentioned in terms of how to avoid low quality services or kind of garbage stuff is the most is the first thing, right? So what I what I would recommend small businesses on don't try to take a budget and say, hey, this is what we have for SEO. Let's force it and make it work. Don't try to force a square peg in a round hole. You know, if you don't have the budget, and I would qualify that as you know, if you're talking with an agency, sub $1,000 a month. If you don't have that budget, don't try to go out there and find someone who will do it for half that or a fraction because someone will raise their hand and chances are they're either not going to provide the value or worst case scenario, they get you in a lot of trouble. So I think the first thing is to know how to approach SEO in a way that's, that's going to not get you in trouble with the, in terms of your business and wasted investment, right? If you can't afford that, that level of spend at an agency, you may want to look at a consultant, so someone who specifically consults around SEO. Uh, you do need to be wary of hiring someone who is a quote-unquote digital marketing consultant that does every channel under the sun. Look at SEO the same way you would look at um, medicine for comparison, right? Um, you could say that everyone who works in digital marketing are all different doctors, right? SEO would be one niche, would be one specialty. Web development or paid search or social media would be another. So while everyone in there is a technology professional, just like everyone between cardiologists and oncologists and brain surgeons are all doctors, they have very different subspecialties. Make sure that you are dealing with an SEO specialist, not someone who just happens to do that among a bunch of other things. So that's the first thing, being able to navigate that, that process of hiring someone um, the right way. And then outside of that, I would say the, in, until you can engage at a super deep level with SEO, probably with an agency or with a consultant, trying to go in there and do it yourself and get technical can be very dangerous. So don't try to go in and learn how to manipulate Google's algorithm because the, the first things that you'll – learn about can get you in a lot of trouble. So follow some, some really high-level rules. What are the questions my customers have? What are the problems that they are trying to solve? Right? So if it's um, uh, heating and AC repair, what are the most common issues? What are the things people are calling about? What are the, people, uh, what are the things uh, people have problems with? And then plan a, a strategy around your site where you are creating individual pages around each of those topics. And don't be stingy with, the, with, the, with sharing your expertise, right? So if you have a, an issue like, hey, you know, I've got, uh, you know, I've got uh, radiant heat and, um, you know, my, my heater just goes all the way to max and has no control. You know, if that's a common issue, then maybe think about how you can um, – break down that issue, talk about the factors, and talk about potential solutions, and put that into, onto a page on your site. Uh, break up the content on, on that page in small paragraphs, bulleted lists, tables, ways that make it easy for the user to concern, consume that information. Uh, so the first thing is being, being weary about who you decide to hire. The second would be focusing the content that you're creating on your site around the specific problems and issues that your customers have. And think about a natural hierarchy on the site. Um, if you're selling shoes, it probably makes sense to have subcategories for men's shoes and women's shoes. Then beyond that, maybe subcategories for men's tennis shoes and women's tennis shoes. So think about those kind of logical structures that lend themselves to your particular business uh, in regards to your products and services and then create pages that I would say somewhere between 200 words to 2,000 words that demonstrate your expertise, help people learn about their problem, um, and then how you can help them solve that issue. Um, so content is really what I'm talking about, right? You've heard the, the, um, you know, the phrase content is king. It is very much the case with an SEO. We've got technical aspects of um, SEO. Uh, we've got things around link building, but the thing that you can do fairly safe on your own without getting in trouble is creating valuable content on your website that directly speaks 
to the problems your customers have. If you do that and you're writing it in original way and you're not stealing that content, your risk is pretty low. So you can get your marketing people together and say, hey, you know, we want to expand the site to cover all of these different topics. Um, start putting that content together. Make sure it's well written. No spelling mistakes. It's broken up to be easily consumable um, by users who are going to those pages on your website. Um, and then ultimately get some calls to action in there. If you've got a, a, a piece that's on you know, a particular issue, say with, a, with an AC uh, problem for an AC uh, and heating repair guy, um, at the bottom of that page you probably want to have a form that says, hey, uh, if, you're, if you're having issues, we'd be happy to provide you with a free estimate. Uh, have a conversion point at the end of each page so that if you've shared information in the right way, you've connected with your customer. Um, chances are in a lot of these businesses, they do need you, but they're trying to figure out how to make decisions on how to solve the problem. Give them the information to help them make a decision, and then be right there to be the guy uh, to provide that solution when they're ready to make that decision. Um, does that does that make sense? That is one of the, some one of the best explanations I've heard in a long. I've been in this biz, uh, business for over 20 years for small business, and that's one of the best SEO explanations I've heard in a long time. Uh, congratulations. We're talking with Chris. Rogers, he's uh, founder and CEO of Colorado uh, SEO Pro. Uh, we're talking about uh, how to use uh, uh, your talent, your content, and his his talent and his content to to grow uh, grow a small business. Uh, I'd like to go on and ask you uh, this question. Uh, for instance, in our site. Um, recalculating that biz. All of a sudden, over the last month, uh, three or four shows, we have all of the shows uh, listed on the program, uh, mm -hmm. have suddenly taken off. The number of people who have downloaded the show you know, from different months, different topics, have has suddenly uh, gone through the roof. Does that happen often, that uh, certain pages all of a sudden become... Uh, um, more valuable to outside people, or is that just uh, something that happened on our pages? Well, it's a tough question to answer to answer without digging into your analytics and getting a lot more information. But um, in general, there are this is what I would say: there are really five factors that will impact search engine rankings when it comes to SEO. We have on-page SEO which is what are the pages on your site, how are they linked together, what are the topics, what are the keywords used, what's the education level of how it's written, um, all of that, everything the user sees when they go there. We have technical SEO, which is when Google comes and scans your website to go to index and, and uh, kind of catalog all these pages for, for users, can they access everything on the site? Are they running into broken links, duplicate content, duplicate metadata? That's really the technical side of SEO. Then we've got off-page SEO. Those are the backlinks or links coming from other websites pointing back to you that give you credibility in Google's eyes. Then, then outside of the things that you control, there's also competition, right? What did your competitors do? What did the other websites do that might have changed that landscape? And then the fifth and final factor is Google's algorithm. So within everything I described, you've got a lot of different variables. Um, but in short, it could be that, hey, Google's algorithm changed, and now content that was deemed less relevant or valuable before is now more relevant or valuable. Um, you could have had something with a competitor. Maybe you had a competitor in search, right, Someone, another website, that started uh, you know, doing some uh, underhanded stuff. I don't know, buying links, paying for cheap SEO programs with guaranteed results, that kind of stuff, and Google caught them. Right? So now they've dropped down. All of a sudden, your site is going up. Or who knows? Maybe a couple of these shows were just so awesome um, and so well optimized on the on-page side that they started ranking. You started getting backlinks to those pages, getting traffic. Google could see the engagement you know, um, on those mm -hmm. pages, and that, and that was the driving force. So uh, unfortunately, no straight answer and a lot of possibilities. Well, I'm, I'm sorry for... Uh... Uh, well, I'm not sorry, but uh, um, 
uh, I, I often use what happens to us since we also are a small business because if it yeah. happens to us, it probably happens to somebody else. And um, yeah, absolutely. Um, but uh, you also uh, uh, want to talk about uh, place-based uh, SEO uh, uh, um, about localizing. Did you want to? Uh, was I wrong on that? Or yeah. Did you have some well, on, no, I can definitely. That? I, yeah, I think it's I think it's super relevant um, considering the audience, right? So, I'm assuming we've got a lot of people that, um, you know, small businesses, um, to probably not huge budgets. Um, there's a lot of people out there that need SEO that, that it just doesn't work in their budget. And then a lot of those companies, I'm assuming, are local businesses, right? So when we talk about local SEO, it's kind of its own little niche. At the same time, all of the traditional factors that I mentioned before around SEO uh, have a big impact on local SEO. And really what, when I talk about local SEO, what I'm talking about is when you do a search um, or when your customers do a search in – a local area looking for a local provider. Um, that is local search. It strongly correlates with Google's map pack or that map that comes up that lists out all the different businesses. Um, so I'd say one of the basic things around local SEO is um, called NAP. It's an acronym uh, for name, address, phone number. You want to make sure that your business has listings that are consistent on as many local aggregator sites as possible. What's a local aggregator site? So local aggregator sites would be basically business directories. A lot of them can be local. So these are things like um, you know, Yelp. It could be City Search, uh, Yellowpages.com. Um, all these places where Google can scan and find your business listing, you want your name, address, and phone number to appear exactly the same across as many of those directory sites as possible. You also want a link going back to your website. So what this does is it really just enforces with Google that, hey, this is the name of this business that is located at X address that services X area. Right? So you're enforcing with Google that this is a local business. Um, there are a few sites that you can go to to kind of audit that. Um, one is Yext, Y-E-X-T. And they have an audit tool that you can go in and put your website and your business in, and it will give you kind of an audit on, on your local listings. Uh, the good thing about this is within that site, you should be able to find a list of the local aggregators. Right? Um, I will warn you, if you go to Yext and do the search, um, they will get your information, and they will call you and try to sell you things. Um, in general, we, we don't uh, necessarily recommend Yext, um, but it is, a, it is a powerful tool. Um, Moz Local, M-O-Z Local, they also have an audit tool that you can go in and put your, your business name and uh, you know, information in there, and then they'll give you a score and say, okay, your listing looks good on these sites. It doesn't look good on these sites. Um, Moz Local um, isn't necessarily as complete as we would like it to be, but it is a pretty solid tool. Um, so the first thing are those, the NAP, name, address, phone number, business listings, um, populating those on as many sites as possible for, for those local aggregator sites. The next thing that I would mention is um, start looking at producing some local content, right? And look for local directories. You may have a local chamber of commerce. There may be other local business directories that are associated with your city or town. Um, see what's out there. Um, go on Google, look around for those things, local directories by your city name, that kind of thing. Um, and then local content, if you've got a blog on your site, and uh, these days you probably should have a blog on your site, going in and um, having content that is relevant to both the cities that you target and the services that you provide. Um, and this can get really tricky because you may have to get creative, right? If you're a, a heating and AC repair person and you're you know, servicing uh, Downers Grove, Illinois, how do you come up with unique content for that? Well, it can be, it can be tricky. Maybe you, maybe you offer a um, – you have a unique offering around a specific type of service, and you create a blog post on how, you know, we're going into summer. You know, these are the leading things that happen with your, with your heating unit um, that might, you know, result in you needing heating repair. Uh, within the Downers Grove area, we've seen temperatures spike historically, blah, 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 blah. So 
there's some creativity that needs to be done there, but by tying in your services with the locations that you service in creative ways, you're, you're connecting the services you provide with that locality. Um, and this doesn't mean that every blog that you write is going to be successful. It is a numbers game. So a lot of them are going to not go anywhere and probably not get traffic. And hopefully you get a few gems in there as you're creating this content that really drives some search and some business. Um, but local content would be another um, area that you can target. And then you know, think about any kind of off, offline uh, promotions and events that might be out there that you might be able to ultimately get some uh, backlinks from. So um, let's see a good example. We, um, I volunteer at um, the Denver Metro Chamber of Commerce and the, for the Small Business Development um, Center. And um, you know, as they put out publications, uh, they may put a listing that says, you know, Chris Rogers will be talking coming up this Wednesday, and here's a link to his website. Um, so I'm getting a link that's relevant to a particular geographic area that's also relevant to the, to the services that I provide. Does that make sense? Well, it's so much sense, Chris, that we've, we've run out of time. Uh, we've been talking <laughs> with Chris Rogers. He's founder and CEO of Colorado uh, SEO Pros. Uh, a link to his website will be on uh, recalculating.biz tonight where you can hear this and every other program and tell us what guests you want. But Chris, uh, your website again for, for people, and uh, well, you have to come back because you really have, uh, it's been really a, a, a glorious time and we've learned a lot. But your website, yeah, please? Thank, yeah, thank you so much. It's coloradoseopros.com. And we do, we do serve businesses nationally, so we're not, we don't just work with Colorado businesses. And if you're looking for resources on SEO where you can go and kind of learn on your own, in the footer of our website, uh, coloradoseopros.com, you'll see a section around learning SEO. And we've got a lot of solid resources and websites uh, that you can go to to try to learn SEO on your own. Well, thank you so much for being with us today. It's been a really informative uh, time with him. Thank you, Chris. Thank you so much. Fail proof strategies for small business. He tells us of his life successes and failures that have made him and his clients so successful. Over the years, Bob has brought 77 companies back from the brink and changed them into thriving, profitable businesses. His energy is amazing, and at 74, he proves that you can still have a great deal to give others if you just try. His suggestions are easy to understand and very helpful. One insight struck me was that most companies do not have a plan. The old Chinese proverb says, if you don't know where you're going, then any road will take you there, is true today. Bob Beth Bethel's book, Strengthen Your Business, can be found at Amazon.com or can be ordered at your local bookstore. This has been Dan Perkins with your Recalculating.biz featured book. Recalculating, the program dedicated to American small business. Dan Perkins here from Recalculating.biz with your small business tip of the day. Have you ever worked really hard to land an order only to find out that you lost it? There are times where we really want an order from a prospective client. And then you find out after all your hard work, the order went to a competitor. We learn wisdom from our failures much more than from our successes. It still hurts to lose the order, but losing an order teaches us a great deal about what kind of business person we really are. So here's your recalculating.biz small business tip of the day. When you find out that you lost the order, don't send an email. Send a letter to the head of the business unit that placed the order. Tell that person that you are disappointed that you didn't get the order, but that you'll work even harder to get the next one. Ask him to tell you what you can do so the next time the order's in play, you can win it. This has been Dan Perkins with your Recalculating.biz Small Business Tip of the Day. Dan Perkins here from Recalculating.biz with your Small Business Tip of the Day. Small business funding is easier these days thanks to a new breed of lender called FinTech Lenders. These internet-based lenders cut the time between applying for funds and getting the funds to just hours instead of months. They also make it easier to repay your loans, but their costs might be a little higher for their service. The next time you need dollars for your small business, try them. 
you might like to change. I'm Dan Perkins for Recalculating.biz and your small business tip of the day. Thank you for joining us on Recalculating. We hope the information you received on today's episode was helpful to you in starting and growing your business. Please go to our website, Recalculating.biz, to contact us, to listen to past shows, and see special offers. Until next time, remember, if you grow, we grow. Join us next week for more helpful ideas to make your business a great success. Recalculating, a program designed to help you be successful. 